Hey guys, Capital Cosm here. Before we start this video, I just want to let you know that I believe that we are on the cusp of a major uranium bull market. Now, these things don't happen every other week. The last uranium bull market peaked in 2007, the one before that, in 1978. So when these things happen, you've got to take advantage of it. And how explosive are they? Well, you've all heard the stories, uranium skyrocketing from $10 to $20, all the way up to $150 in these uranium bull markets. Where will it go this time around? Well, we don't know. We'll see. But you've got to take advantage of the opportunity. What better way to do that than to leverage Justin Hune's Uranium Insider newsletter? You get access to his monthly newsletters, his webinars, his stock picks, his portfolio, all of that stuff. You get access to guests that you may not see on YouTube. You get access to having them ask questions that you may not see anywhere else. So I highly recommend if you're going to take part in this uranium bull market, you check out Uranium Insider. Link is down in the description box below. Be sure to click the link. There's quarterly plans, there's annual plans. So if you're kind of tepid, you're kind of hesitant, you could always go with the quarterly plan, kind of test things out, sample things out, see if you like it or not. But the way I see it, guys, you know, you've got to pick the right stock. A lot of these uranium companies are not going to make it to the other side. Now, and, and Justin Hune's uranium portfolio has outperformed the likes of URA by a significant margin. Since 2019, it's up 5x from where it started. So click the link down below and we'll get started right now on the video. Thanks, guys. Yeah, so you mentioned China there. Um, they're building out hundreds of new reactors as we speak right now. And I believe they uh, there's some there's uh, one or two, like a, a, a few thorium molten salt reactors too. So what are they doing differently from us? I also noticed another tweet from you. Um, uh, China recently deployed a, uh, what was it called? A light water reactor? A high believe. temperature gas reactor. High, high temperature reactor, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. High, yeah. yeah, so uh, kind of explain what the significance of that is. Yeah, so China, you're right. Um, you know, right now there's 60 reactors under construction around the world. Um, China, Russia, and India are building 46 of those. Um, there's one under construction in the US, three in America, four in Europe, finishing one in the uae so you get a sense of you know who's actually building interestingly enough um, russia india and china did not sign on to the agreement to triple nuclear energy i mean they're kind of doing it anyway so maybe they didn't need to sign on but but that was kind of an interesting uh interesting thing to kind of remark upon um china you know the vast majority of their efforts are these gigawatt scale these extremely large new uh, water-based nuclear power plants um, they've sort of uh, done a buffet lunch of sampling technologies uh, from around the world, uh, from the U.S., even from Canada, uh, from from France uh, and other places. Uh, and they've sort of settled in on a sort of standardized gigawatt scale reactor technology. And that's the uh, bread and butter of their fleets and of, of their future. But, you know, once you have a healthy, dynamic, vibrant nuclear industry, you can afford to sort of play around on the margins and, and look at other use cases for nuclear. So. Right now, um, nuclear is used basically exclusively for electricity. Um, there's some applications in district heating, sort of low-grade uh, temperature or low-grade process heat. Um, one of the challenges of decarbonization um, is the need to replace medium and high-grade process heat that's required for you know endless industrial processes and the so-called hard-to-abate sectors. Um, so a high-temperature gas reactor gives you, um, you know, working fluids of five, 600 degrees Celsius that you can use for a lot of industrial processes. Um, and so there's an interest in, in looking at that. Um, this is a technology developed in Germany and then South Africa, um, still, you know, pretty early days. When we talk about, you know, the experience we have with nuclear, you can think about our water-based fleets. We're at about 17,000, 18,000 years uh, of reactor years of operation. So we've done a ton of troubleshooting and we've really perfected our operations. Um, molten salt reactors, we have about three reactor years uh, of experience. Um, and high temperature gas reactors, I'm going to hazard to guess, you know, maybe 20 or 30 years of experience. So that gives you a sense, again, of the kind of technical and commercial maturity of these technologies. Um, China is certainly exploring and playing around, uh, but this is not the basis of their, their nuclear fleets moving forward. They're very much focused on um, the traditional water, again, water cooled moderated reactors. Uh, but, you know, exploring some, some use cases for process heat, for instance, uh, on the side. I mean, what are they doing differently from us here in the West that they've been able to get on the ball much more readily? Well, here's the dirty secret about nuclear. Um, it re 
requires some degree of vertical integration, some degree of what uh, the French call dérégisme or dérégiste kind of economic policy, which means that the state takes some kind of role. This is a strategic technology. Obviously, there's proliferation concerns. It's a dual use technology. There's there's weapons application of nuclear. You need to be careful in terms of um, the feedstock and the waste stream of nuclear, etc. Um, and it tends to benefit from a, a, a careful coordination. Um, and what we see in places like China, Russia, South Korea, or the United Arab Emirates um, is really strategic thinking about the sector, um, an alignment of interests uh, that has more of a sort of national goal uh, at its heart. Um, and this is where we're seeing these deployments of standardized reactor technology um, and you know similar design being deployed over and over again usually you know a number of them on the same site to take advantage of all of the learning that that can accrue um, in the west the nuclear ecosystem is a lot more complicated um, there are a number of, of different companies and entities all with fiduciary duties to different shareholders and for instance right now um, in the U, the uh, in europe and america um, there's a dependence uh, on russia for about 25 percent of the uh, enrichment services that we need to run our fleets. Um, this is, uh, there's a long, you know, sorted history as to how we've got to this place, but one would think, you know, given uh, Putin's power politics uh, with gas in Europe that, you know, that might give some thought to making sure that you're not dependent on a uh, foreign adversary for, you know, the enrichment services you need to keep one in 20 American houses and businesses, uh, the lights on. Um, and there's sort of a failure, I think, that that's this is kind of emblematic of, of a failure in the U.S. to have a much more kind of coordinated ecosystem. People will say, well, you know, the original U.S. buildout wasn't sort of state driven, but was driven by large utilities, which in a sense, almost like act as a state. They've got, you know, a rate base that might be you know analogous to a tax base. Um, these were very large um, entities capable of marshalling a lot of low cost capital of distributing risk again onto that rate base, sometimes with consequences. Nuclear is one of the only things that's uh, ever bankrupted a, a large uh, utility. Um, but basically, yeah, I mean, if I'm trying to sum it up, um, I think why we're floundering in the West is you know, in part because of uh, neoliberalism in terms of this idea that there's, you know, government should be small and and not so much involved in terms of national industrial policy uh, and nuclear really requires that. Um, so that's that's kind of in a nutshell, my thesis as to why um, we're seeing these countries deploying quickly. And, you know, if the U.S. decides, and it doesn't need to, I mean, right now, you know, natural gas prices went up. Um, the U.S. is moving in towards becoming an LNG exporter, but also there's there's almost a, a glut of liquefied natural gas in the market right now. Um, there's plenty of gas in the U.S. Um, to to take care of power generation for for quite a while into the future there's not a uh you know again like a pragmatic energy security need for nuclear in the u.s um we're seeing a resurging interest because of of climate on on the one hand um and i guess also because you know that there's probably some understanding that you know gas prices did go unexpectedly high um and made nuclear more economic recently so um complicated reasons i i would just say that the u.s would be wise to at least you know maybe be a little less arrogant um, when it comes to nuclear and say, okay, how how are our adversaries or even friendly countries like South Korea capable of doing this? Maybe there's lessons to be learned. My fear is that the socio-political models in the U.S. are just not not conducive uh, in the end to you know fast, wide-scale deployments of nuclear. Isn't there also an element of regulatory capture by fossil fuel industries as well? Um, I, I saw you uh, tweet the other day, uh, the coal industry had lobbied to um, remove uh, subsidies for the nuclear power industry back in the 60s, you know, not even the 90s, all the way back in the 60s. So uh, doesn't that have to do with that as well? Yeah, I mean, very, very early on, uh, back in, in even the 30s and 40s, um, when there was excitement about, you know, this was, you know, really before we'd even had a controlled chain reaction uh, that occurred in 1942. But in the 30s, there would be, uh, you know, gatherings at the World Petroleum Conference. And um, one of uh, Albert Einstein's friends, Art Eddington, went there and said, you guys are cooked, your days are done. Like, I've I've an analyzed the sun, it's not a ball of fire, that's a fusion reaction. And, and fission is, is on the horizon, and it's going to be, you know, our, our new great source of energy. We're going to eclipse the use of, of oil and gas and coal. Um, and so certainly at that point, there's, um, I think, a fairly well-documented um, 
response by the Rockefeller Foundation to pursue um, and fund uh, particularly uh, studies in genetics, uh, which I think grossly uh, amplified the risks of, of radiation. Um, so I think there's compelling uh, arguments there. There's also, um, you know, there have been campaigns in Australia, for instance, uh, from the coal industry saying, you know, nuclear threatens coal jobs. Um, and it does. Um, so there, there's been those sort of uh, conspiracies, if we want to call them that. I wouldn't say that's the main factor. There's so many things that have held held back nuclear, and, and certainly it's one of them. Um, and the fossil fuel industry, you know, is is powerful and well capitalized. But I wouldn't say that's a dominant force in this day and age. Right. So, I mean, if you look at a chart of nuclear adoption in the United States, stretching all the way out to the 90s, for example, you'll see a steady move up in adoption. And all of a sudden, it just flatlines like the nineties forward. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what's kind of going on there? I'll look for the graph, uh, you know, in the meantime. Yeah. I mean, so a lot of people think uh, that the three mile Island is, is what killed nuclear in the States. Um, the order books were um, overflowing in the sixties and seventies. And while no new nuclear sites, um, uh, you know, were planned after three mile Island, there was a lot of um, inertia in the system. Um, I'd say, you know, in the mid 70s, already the order books were drying up, uh, but enough sites had been planned um, and you know construction uh, had begun that we still saw kind of a uh, an inertia effect. So, for instance, Diablo Canyon um, that was planned prior to Three Mile Island, uh, but was uh, deployed in I believe in the 80s, came online in the late 80s. Um, so in terms of why we stopped building nuclear, again, many, many factors that play there. I'd say a dominant one is um, uh, demand growth dried up. Um, you know, this, this was uh, a forecast from the utilities in the seventies were that, you know, we'd be using three or four times more electricity than we actually are now. Um, and so a lot of plans were made around that, but, um, you know, I probably for a number of reasons, uh, related to the, the oil crisis to recession, and just to the fact that we got a little more efficient in, in our electricity use and, and satiated demand. Um, you're not going to spend billions and billions of dollars on a capital intensive project. If you're not sure you have the customers for the kilowatt hours at the other end. And so, you know, for about three or four decades, we haven't really seen, um, strong demand growth. That's starting to change now, and partially because of uh, climate-related electrification, partially because of reshoring of strategic industries. Um, you know, we accepted this uh, this Francis Fukuyama-like uh, uh, vision of the world. Uh, you know, the literal the end of history that everywhere we were going to move towards the ultimate form of human governments, which is a uh, you know liberal democracies and peace would reign over the world because democracies don't tend to wage war on democracies and. You know, kumbaya, and here we are. Um, you know, after the Russian invasion, very much back in a multipolar world. I don't know if it's fair to say it's a new Cold War, but um, you know, certainly with uh, globalization, we offshored a lot of our heavy industry and strategic industries, and and we're feeling in the West uh, a need to sort of pull that back. That requires uh, a lot more power generation. So part of the reason that power demand stagnated in the eighties, nineties, and two thousands is we basically moved a lot of heavy industry overseas. Um, that that power growth occurred over there. Um, and now we're wanting to to be able to power those industries back home. And that's, again, I think part of what's leading to a nuclear revival in the West right now, certainly much more than, than climate change. Yeah. So if you look at this chart here, um, you've got the North America here in blue, and you can pretty much see the stagnation somewhere, somewhere around the 2000s up until today. But then you also see that same level of stagnation, no matter which part of the world you look at. So, you know, what's going on? What went on outside of the United States to also kind of put a pause on things? Well, something that's really interesting about this graph, actually. So this is looking at terawatt hours. So this is electricity produced. Um, you know, as you're saying, the U.S. fleet um, really, um, we didn't start adding new nuclear reactors. But after Three Mile Island, we really got our act together on operations. Um, so a lot of uh, best practices were being shared. You know, there was a realization that an injury to one was an injury to all. And, you know, through Mile Island, there were, you know, a variety of reasons for why that accident occurred, but it was felt really that it was primarily an operations issue. Um, and so we saw the capacity factors of, of nuclear plants leap from 50, 60% up into the 90s and mid 90s we see now. So without even building new reactors, it's almost as if we added uh, another one third uh, of a fleet of new reactors, but you know, just because we were operating them better. So that's kind of an interesting, um, interesting uh, counterfactual. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, you can see there in the 
2013 or 2011 area, we can see the drop off post Fukushima. Um, but uh, Asia, Asia is bouncing up pretty quickly there. Um, you know, China will soon eclipse France and then the US for the most uh, nuclear reactors in the world. Uh, the US fleet um, was around, I believe, 104 and we're into the high 90s now. Um, and uh, I believe China is going to surpass us by the 2030s. Um, and, you know, they have plans to really continue to grow. And these are pragmatic plans. Um, most of the coal in China is in the uh, northeast, sorry, northwest. And uh, and a lot of the population is in the coastal southeast. Um, I've heard that around 50 percent of rail traffic in China is simply moving coal across the country um, to the load centers um, in the in the southeast. And so that's where a lot of the nuclear construction is occurring, uh, you know, again, just to relieve some of that rail traffic. It's not that they're short on coal, particularly, but it's, it's in the wrong place in terms of the country. Um, but again, it's not that. Um, nuclear is replacing coal or replacing other forms of power generation. Everything is growing in China right now. And that's a little bit, um, you know, what makes me a little more sober. And, you know, I, I said earlier on when you said about the uh, the tripling of nuclear energy, it's it's a great aspirational goal. I, I doubt that we'll see it happen. Um, and that's just because, you know, nuclear is, it is complicated. It takes uh, serious marshalling of the very best people, uh, the most skilled engineers, skilled trades people. Um, it takes institutional excellence. Um, and that, that takes a while. It can be done well. And, and you know, nuclear um, represents the fastest additions of, of clean power per uh, capita around the world. We've seen that over and over again in France, Sweden, um, Ontario even. Um, so it can happen quite quickly. But I mean, even with the explosion in renewables, um, it's not significantly displacing fossil fuels. Uh, it's just sort of adding on top of them. So, you know, I'm, I'm maybe in a little bit of a pessimistic mood coming out of copper, more of a realis realistic mood, but um, that's sort of my best effort at, at trying to explain this graph for you.